So yeah, then that begs the question, who's silly? The rationalist assumes that it's not him. It's like, okay, let's have some evidence. Well, we can fly to the moon. Fair enough, that's one form of evidence. How long has this been working? 200 years. Okay, let's iterate it for a million years yeah, let's and see what happens. Right, now, you know, and you can object to that because you can say, well, who knows where the future will lead and so on. But my point is, is that, well, it's again, it's, what you assume to be true structures your argument and you have to assume something to be true because you don't have infinite knowledge. So you make that initial choice. Why? Well, it might be because you're a true truth seeker. Well, I would be careful about making that claim, right? Because you're probably not. So then who are you? There's no probably about that. Yeah, and not only that, you might be motivated by terrible things that you're not aware of. Like truly terrible things. You know, one of the things Jung said about the shadow, which was for him, that was sort of all those parts of you that weren't very developed and are mad about it because you're like, you know, trying to kill them. And all those sort of storehouse of lies and deception that you've managed and all the things you've left undone and the motivations for doing all that. It's like, that's the shadow. He said, well, the shadow is rooted in hell. And, and, you know, you think, well, that's a nice metaphor. It's like, don't be so sure it's a metaphor. It's, it's not exactly a metaphor. I mean, I, mean, I can, I can, I can tell, elaborate on that a little bit. If you walk down Bloor Street and you watch, you can see people in hell with no problem. Like, they're not only the people who are completely lost, the homeless, but they're the homeless that you cannot look at. And the reason you can't look at them is because they find your act of mirroring their state of existence intolerable. It will instantly enrage them. And that's because they're in chaos, they're in the underworld, but they're in a particular suburb of the underworld. And that little suburb, that's hell. And you think, well, is it, immort is it eternal? Depends on what you mean. It's been around a long time. It's been around a long time and it's really deep. And there's another weird thing about hell, which is if you're in it, no matter how bad it is, there's some stupid thing you can do to make it worse. And that's why it's bottomless. It's not obvious what's a metaphor. You know, does heaven exist? Depends on what you mean. I think people get glimpses of it all the time. Those are, those are the times in your life when the meaning shines through. It's like, that's a place. When the meaning shines through, that's a place. Like if you conceptualize things as four-dimensional, this place shifts with time. So we're actually sitting in a multitude of places here. Now and then that place configures itself so that it's as perfect as it can be. You get a glimpse. And then you think, well, what if, what if it could always be like that? It's like, well, what if it could be always like that? You know, so you might say, for example, what would happen if everybody told the truth? We know what happens when people don't. You get the gulag archipelago. What's the opposite of that? Well, we don't know. We do know that there's an opposite. So, people are incautious about their discussions of what constitutes real. They don't even notice their own experience. Never been to the underworld? It's like you've been there every time things have fallen apart in your life. I tell people that all the time in my lectures. Here's what the underworld means. You've been married for 10 years, you're happily married. You come home, your wife's gone, there's a note that says, I'm leaving with my lover of the last 10 years. It's like, well, you were somewhere before you walked into the house, and now you're somewhere different. Where are you now? Well, you're where you go when the bottom drops out. Where is that? Well, it's in the underworld. It's like you're in the underworld. You're in that chaotic state that exists before order is constructed. You and, go there all the time. And the reason people can't, can't see the connection between their, their experience and these earlier um, mythological representations is because 
people are being anachronistic and reinterpreting the mythological representations as if they're scientific theories. As if these people were naive scientists. Yeah. Really, what they were doing is coming up with images to explain things that they couldn't otherwise represent, but were real in terms of their lived experience. Is that Abs absolutely, is that absolutely? Okay. Yeah. Wh why would we think they were naive scientists? What? What is a chimp a naive scientist? Like, it's just silly. It's, it, they weren't naive scientists, whatever they were doing. Well, I think they were naive phenomenologists, but they weren't very naive. They weren't concerned with material reality. They were concerned with the nature of being. It's not, I mean, that's Heidegger's claim, right? He believed that, and I, again, I didn't know this until much later. Heidegger believed that philosophy actually lost its way with the Greeks, with Plato, for example, when things became rationalized. Nietzsche thought the same thing in many ways because he was very interested in the Dionysian, right? Which is more like, well, that's more like lived experience, the Dionysian, you know? That's the chemist who goes out and, you know, maybe he's a punk rocker in his spare time and he goes out in the evening and listens to a, you know, a thrash metal band and pounds himself against other people. It's like, and doesn't see any contradiction there. It's like, well, one's rational and the other isn't, that's a contradiction. You know, and well, you find the irrational activity enjoyable. Well, how do you account for that? You don't. You just keep the world separate. It's like, so these, our ancestors were phenomenologists. And they were accounting for the, their, their landscapes. They're the geography of being. It's right. well, there's an underworld. Well, when do you go there? Well, when, when things fall apart. It's like, that's where you end up. Like, everyone gets that. You know, I tell these stories to retirees and all sorts of people say, look, you know, there's a place that you go when everything falls apart. It's like, oh, I've been there. Then the question is, well, what do you do when you get there? Because everybody needs to know that. That's another thing that religious stories are trying to tell you. When things fall apart, what do you do? Well, we don't think of when things fall apart as a place. But that's our problem. It's a place. I mean, people live in it. All you have to do is go look on the street. It's like, oh, look, that person's in the underworld. It's like, and that person's in hell. And you can tell, but you won't look. You know, what usually happens in a circumstance like that is there's so much in hell that you'll just walk around them and you won't look at them. Well, why not? You don't want to go there. Yeah, and, and that's we right. have that expression in English. Yeah. I don't want to go there. Right, right. So, right. so there, there is, encoded in the way we think, there is this inherent locality or geography. Yeah, well, and it is a geography. Like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a slice of space-time, you know? So, you know, it's also the street, but it's not just the street. It's, it's, it's the being of the street. It's everything that's, that's afforded by the representation of street in our mind. It has, it has other meanings beyond what we, which is something we didn't touch on at all, actually, which we had, which is um, as the com complexity management theory mm. angle in the sense that how we compartmentalize reality is not at all a given, right? I mean, the... No, you do it on the fly, right? you know, and, and you do it for pragmatic reasons, you know, and so in some sense what you do is you look for the simplest possible and least energetic way of conceptualizing the current situation so that the next thing you want to do happens. It's something like that. And I like to think about it in terms of resolution, you know, because I think resolution is a really useful idea. Most of our representations of reality are extremely low resolution. Like, we'll rely on a thumbnail. Well, why not? Well, it's good enough, right? It's pragmatic. It's good enough, you know? Don't make it any more complex than it has to be. And what you are managing always is complexity because the thing that you're, the representation you use, which is an image, let's say, is a low resolution representation of the reality behind the image. So, for example, you're sitting there. Okay, well, I can't see your back. So I can't see your family, I can't see your culture, I can't see your education, I can't see the biosphere that you're an embedded part of, I can't see any of your substructures. It's like they're all there, they're just as real as the thing that I see. They're causally implicated in everything that you do. It's like that's complexity. So you know, maybe, you know, I'm assuming that you're, you're I'm assuming that you're what we both decided to allow to be possible here, right? Because we're both polite, we're doing this little act that you know we both agree on, we've never met, but we, we're gonna run this routine, we're gonna play by the rules. But you know, like, for all I know, you could just turn 
left right now. You know, and then all of a sudden, all that complexity is like, it's there. That's chaos. It's like, that's a potential too, because maybe I think, well, what we're doing is too mundane. It's boring. I'm, 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 I'm caught in it. It's like, I hope you turn left a little bit, because then that's the water of life too, that, you know, that refreshing complexity comes back, but hopefully not too much of it, right? I, I, I don't want too much of it. I want a little bite-sized piece of it that'll make me interested and not terrified. So that's complexity. And that's, that's a better way of conceptualizing what the terror management guys are after with regards to the fear of death. You know, so 